See, we're going to have our snack, we're going to have our lunch, but then we're going to have a variety of different places, both inside and out, that we're going to be able to talk to each other. So this isn't a, you don't have your name and a placard at a table where we're saying you are over here and you're over there. We want you to interact with each other. We want you to talk to each other. We want you to learn from each other. And as Shalom Wald has said, we want you to challenge each other because that's what we're here to do. To, um, so anyway, a couple of quick reminders, and I see that our panelists are filing in. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Chen uh, Yuna. Great, thank you, thank you, Josh. Um, I, I think we're still waiting for one panelist to make her way in, but maybe whilst uh, whilst whilst we wait, I'll briefly introduce all of our speakers. So thanks, everyone. I hope you're still awake and, and refilled on coffee. Uh, welcome to panel two on China's political and economic clout in the Middle East. So we're going to be focusing um, very directly on the, on the Middle East region here. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting one. I hope you will save your questions for the end. Uh, and maybe in the interest of time at the end, we'll, we'll take a bunch of questions and then go back to the panel. So first, uh, we're going to have Dr. Shin, Sim Li Chen. Uh, Dr. Sim is a specialist on the political economy of, of Russian and Gulf energy and its intersection with international politics. She is based at uh, Khalifa University and uh, she's also published multiple books including Low Carbon Energy in the Middle East and North Africa and External Powers in the Gulf Monarchies. Uh, she's, her interests include the politics of renewable and nuclear energy, Gulf Asia exchanges, Russia-China relations in the Middle East and uh, Russia-Gulf interactions. She will be followed by Dr. Oshrit Bedvaka, who is a, a research fellow here at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. She specializes in Indian foreign policy and security, and she's also a lecturer at the Reichman University um, at the Department of Strategy, Diplomacy and Security at Shaman College. Finally, we will have Dr. Wan Duan Yong, uh, who is the director of the Center for China's Overseas Interest Studies and he's an associate professor at the Shanghai International Studies University in China. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Wang will be, will be talking to us about the new crossroads of, of uh, Chinese in Afghanistan. So I'm going to pass the mic over and invite Dr. Li Chen Shin to speak to us now about coordinated engagement, Russia and China in MENA. Hi everyone. Um, hope you had a good coffee break. Just one and a half hours more till lunch, so please bear with us. Um, so my topic for today is I've uh, thrown out the question of whether there actually is coordinated engagement between China and Russia in the Middle East. Uh, this question comes about because when when people, in, in, even in the U.S., talks about Russia and China, it, it's always mentioned in the same sentence. Uh, we see them tandem voting in the U.N. on a variety of vetoes, unfortunately, uh, usually in the Middle East. Um, we see them being mentioned together in the same sentence. And let me just quote here a speech by General McKenzie, who was the CENTCOM uh, commander uh, in, in CENTCOM. This was in 2021, and he says, I quote, the United States faces increasing competition in the region, in the MENA region, from Russia and China, both vying for power and influence through a combination of means. So this just goes to show my point that they are generally talked about together. The question though is, do they actually coordinate their actions in the Middle East, right? Are they proactively acting together to achieve um, a, you know, a, a synchronized set of goals? And so this is what um, my presentation will be about. So I'm going to suggest to you that Russia and China in the Middle East, they engage with the region through four particular pathways. And though they seem to act together, I'm going to suggest that there actually isn't 
really, um, or I haven't found um, any uh, coordination, close proactive coordination. And if you'd like to correct me on that, I'd be pleased um, to take your um, questions with the um, at the end. So let's look at the first pathway, and that's on political approaches. By this, I mean that both Russia and China use a variety of bilateral as well as multilateral fora um, to, to, to uh, you know, meet together with states in MENA. You've heard about the Africa Forum. That's something that China has with the African states. Russia also has this multilateral forum. There is China and the Gulf Forum, and similar thing happens um, with Russia. So they both use bilateral um, as well as multilateral forum. But the difference here, even though they both use multilateral fora, the difference is that China has a much more um, systematic approach to these kinds of partnerships. You have different grades, right, ranging from strategic to comprehensive strategic, and it's much more comprehensive. Whereas if you look at Russia, it does have these kinds of partnerships, but in a much more limited fashion. Now, just because Russia has fewer of these uh, multilateral, uh, sorry, these bilateral fora, it doesn't mean that they use less strategic partnerships. It just means that they haven't been as systematic as the Chinese have in organizing these things. And let me give an example. If you look at the Russian portion, a very big glaring omission there in terms of strategic partnership would be anyone, which country in the Middle East which you would expect to be? Um, Israel, where else? Syria. Yeah, Syria, right? Obviously the big glaring one would be, you know, Syria since Russia, since 2014. So you have some of these glaring errors or, or absences. Morocco is another one, right? And so, why? Why is this so? Is it bureaucracy is not acting strategically enough? Um, because these are clearly very important. I mean, you have military intervention in, in, in Syria, on behalf of Syrians. Um, so, we don't know the answer to the question, but all we can say is that the Chinese place much more importance in having these strategic partnerships documented. Right? The Russians have them, but they're not documented. Just spoken of, Putin refers to, say, uh, Turkey as a strategic partner, but it, you, they haven't signed documented um, proof, if you like, of that. So I think it's just, um, it's, it's just an organizational and bureaucratic approach to these kinds of partnerships. Now what are the other polit uh, political approaches that they use? Um, both China and Russia, they have a system of um, special envoys to the Middle East. Uh, China has two, I think Russia has three, they call them special representatives, whether it's to the Middle East or to Syria or to specific conflicts. Right? So what is the purpose of the political approaches? Um, that's to give uh, Russia and China more heft in the region, there's more systematic engagement throughout the different levels of the bureaucracy. Okay, so I think this is one quite um, interesting approach, but they do the first slightly. Um, the second economic, uh, uh, second approach I want to highlight is the economic approach. And here, of course, China is much more engaged with MENA than Russia. Right? Um, you've heard from the first panel all about the economic statecraft, China, huge trade partner, huge FDI, and I will not belabor that point. What I will mention is that if you look at the economic approaches, you will see that China is generally the top trading partner, the first three trading partners of different states in MENA. Whereas if you look at Russia, it you know it's not that right, it's not within the top ten of most of these MENA countries. So you have that disparity there in terms of using economics as a pathway of influence for Russia and China in MENA. Having said that though, I will caution you to think that Russia does not emphasize economic approaches because its most important economic approach would be the OPEC plus platform where it coordinates the oil markets um, with the other petroleum exporting countries in the Middle East. Uh, obviously the, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE more important ones, as well as Russia and Kazakhstan from outside OPEC itself. So this is a really important platform for Russia to insert itself in the Middle East uh, on such an important uh, 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 commodity as oil. 
Um, Russia also differs from China in the sense that it is very much a player in the nuclear exports. So um, Russia, as some of you know, will have, uh, is building reactors in Egypt, in Turkey. It's interested in building reactors in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but this is not something that China um, does actively. So, so again, we find the difference here. And it's, of course, because uh, Russia has a much longer history and success um, at uh, nuclear technology. Um, another area of difference is in food exports. China doesn't do that in the Middle East, but Russia is a big food exporter to the Middle East. Um, in the UAE, where I live, uh, something like 50% of uh, UAE's uh, grain exports come from Russia. In Saudi, 70% of barley, which is used as cattle feed, uh, comes from Russia. So um, they do differ in their economic approaches. It's not all uh, the same game. The third approach is a security approach. And here you will find that China has bases in the region. Sometimes they look like commercial bases, but as the first panel mentioned, there's some kind of a dual use uh, going around. Uh, Russia also has bases, obviously in Syria, so they both use this, this particular operational uh, tactic. Um, arms sales, Russia pips China enormously in MENA. Um, but again, here is the difference. Um, Russia exports mainly conventional weapons, right? Um, but China does export weapons too on a much, much, much small scale, but a very niche and a very important one, and that's drones, right? Um, China has big old drones, um, which they export actively to the region. Um, and it has been used in conflicts in the region, whereas Russia doesn't really do much drone exports, um, partly because um, the semiconductor technology, uh, it, it really doesn't have its own native semiconductor industry, so that's a problem when it comes to drones. Um, and also I think the fur, uh, so Russia is much more security-minded in MENA than China. Why is that so? Um, that's because Russia, for Russia, MENA is, is not the key theatre, right? It is important, but it's not the key theatre for Russian foreign policy. Where is the key theatre? That's over there in Europe. So Russia is really interested in securing its western borders, you know, from perceived NATO incursions and all that kind of thing. So it needs its back door in the east of Russia to be quite calm, right? To have no conflicts, which is why it really puts quite a lot of emphasis on security approaches in trying to come up with a Middle East plan, for example, in prioritizing uh, fighting against terrorism in MENA because it needs that secure eastern border because its western border is where it feels most of the threats come from. Do China and US share the same views about US security in the region? Well, uh, they do share a certain number of views, which is that they would like to have less preponderance of the US. But um, I would argue that they both like a US, or they both desire a, some kind of a minimal US security presence because it brings stability to the region. With stability, you can have trade. So I think they both value the US presence, um, but uh, uh, Russia definitely would like to see that much more reduced. In terms of public diplomacy, they have certain similarities in uh, soft power projection through Confucius Institute and Russell which is a Russian version of a um, soft power institute which tries to promote Russian culture and values. Um, there is much more of the Confucius uh, Institute, sorry about that. Uh, many more Confucius Institutes in MENA, less Russo Trubyshevsko in MENA, but nevertheless it's still an example of an outreach. Where I would like to just stress is the idea of um, Islam is it an asset or liability in MENA. Russia feels that it is more of an asset, so it has its um, friends in Chechnya go around the region to the Gulf and having some kind of informal diplomacy promoting the Russian goals, whereas of course, as you heard from the first panel, China sees it more as a liability, that better not to mention this long fact. Um, in terms of new approaches, uh, new areas of public diplomacy, you will see that health is a big thing. And here again, um, interestingly enough, um, more countries have not used cider farm. Um, most of them have plumped for um, compared to it's, it's much more often used as the uh, spurting vaccine 
rather than the science farm, possibly again because of Russia's longer track record in these kinds of scientific um, uh, measures. So um, in summary, um, what are the key takeaways? I would say that we, I did not find any proactive coordination between the two. They didn't actually sit down and say, let's do this, let's do the economic approach this way. I'm going to sell food, you go sell drugs, right? But you didn't see this kind of sit down and plan it. Um, and I prefer to think of the relationship as a force multiplier. And what that means is that with Russia and China acting together, they actually, actually multiply each other's strengths. So the example I gave you in uh, uh, weapons was an example. Russia does conventional, China does drones. So it multiplies the effect of what the panel mentioned earlier, authoritarian states in MENA. Right? It's not just having to do with Russia, it's having to do with China. So that multiplies their influence. Another example I can give you is in terms of media. Right? In terms of media, um, two of them use a lot of social media, right? uh, Arabic language media, but they use it quite differently. So Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese uh, Arabic language media usually praises Chinese uh, accomplishments in MENA, whereas Russian Arabic language media blackens, they use what we call black PR, to blacken uh, Western perceived faults or inconsistencies. So it's a very different use of social media. Um, but what they do, they actually amplify each other's voice. So the Russian media have found that the Chinese actually amplify what the Russians have said in their media. Right? So this kind of force multiply effect is actually quite detrimental um, for US power in this region because it acts on the long-term perception of US power. As a final remark, I invite you to think about whether all this relationship is going to change with Russia's invasion. Is Russia going to be seen as weaker than Nina because of the is China still going to find a value in using Russia as a false multiplier for anti-Western, anti-US kind of um, coalition in the Middle East? And I think um, that's something that's really interesting to think about. And the second thing is, is China going to want to be associated with a revolutionary power that actually wants to you know, really change the rules of the system? Not, not just some of the values I mean, you heard the first panel speak. It's not just the changing the liberal values and keeping the structure, but as well as to challenge things like sovereignty, right, which is a big part of the international stability we have. So does China want to be lumped into that same category of a revolutionary power rather than a revisionist power? So those are the questions I invite you to think about, and thank you for your patience. Thank you so much, Dr. Sim, um, for that fascinating presentation and also fantastically timed as well. Uh, I, I mean, whilst, you're, whilst we switch, I, I want to just pose a question for the discussion later, which is uh, in the wake of the Russian-Ukraine war and, uh, and this apparent alliance of solidarity we've seen between Russia and China, where do you see fissures or where do you see points of tension in the Middle East? Are there areas of competition or, or do you think there will be uh, greater coordination perhaps through like SEO mechanisms? Um, next, I invite Dr. Oshrit Bervadkar, sorry for that, uh, from JISS and her presentation is going to be on India's Arab Mediterranean Corridor versus China's Belt and Road Initiative as a means of strategic connectivity. Over to you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> uh, so hi, uh, I'm going to speak today about uh, India Arab Mediterranean Corridor uh, uh, and the China Belt Road Initiative. So um, as you know, India and China have a long and ambivalent relationship that has often been described in uh, contradicting terms. Uh, we call it the four C's, uh, containment, conflict, cooperation, and competition. Um, I think that India is among the few countries that since the beginning refused to join the BRI. But if we think about um, India's relationship with the BRI, I think it's more complex and includes uh, various uh, challenges and dilemmas in the uh, national, regional, and the international level. Um, over the years, uh, Indian policymakers have raised their concerns regarding the countries joining the BRI 
and the lack of transparency of some of the BRI projects. Uh, but there, we can agree there is a strong opposition in India uh, regarding the BRI, but this opposition should not be mistaken as uh, opposition to any cooperation with China. Uh, the BRI poses many challenges for, for India. I think India is one of the few countries that uh, provided justification for its refusal to join the BRI because in their eyes it violates its national sovereignty. Uh, actually, the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is the flagship project of the BRI, uh, they called the jewel of the BRI, is actually goes through uh, Pakistan-controlled areas of Jammu and Kashmir, which is claimed by India since October 47. Uh, the CPO, uh, CPUC is not only cement roads and routes in uh, Kashmir and Gibi Balitistan, it's also in a way it changes and alters the status quo in this area, something that is not necessarily in India's interest. And um, for the Indians, I think this could be seen as an uh, intervention in the conflict, something that India has never uh, accepted. Um, one of the concerns of New Delhi is that the CPUC uh, will actually be able to deliver its promises and uh, strengthen Pakistani economic capabilities. That means that uh, uh, you know higher expenditure as well for uh, the military, and that could uh, fuel and arm race in the region. Something that India has no interest in. One of New Delhi concerns uh, regarding the CPUC is this. Corridor, which actually connects Xinjiang between um, Gaudar, this port. Um, their concern is that this port, which is actually uh, owned by Chinese state-owned enterprise, can turn to a uh, permanent military facility that could threaten the Indian naval forces operating out of the bases from the subcontinent. Uh, so basically, this port, the Gaudar port, gives Beijing and Islamabad uh, strategic advantages uh, in the Indian Ocean over India's regional power. Um, the BRI as well hampered uh, some of uh, India's connectivity project, uh, the project they're called uh, BCIM, which includes Bangladesh, China, India, and Myanmar. Uh, China agreed, and they were talking about it towards the late 90s, but what happened is that China um, made it part of the BRI and now India cannot support it. Uh, India as well is concerned with the uh, construction support in, uh, in Colombo, the Havatuta in Sri Lanka, uh, in Myanmar as well, but also the Chittagong in Bangladesh. And the problem is that Chinese, China is highly invested in, in these countries and uh, India is worried, India is want to preserve its uh, position as uh, as the regional hackman, maritime hackman in this uh, region and China's investments in this region definitely in route on that position. Um, we should not forget that the BRI is after all a Chinese brand and India under Narendra Modi may have a problem with that. Uh, India is trying to create, uh, to prevent Chinese hegemony in, in Asia and uh, create a strategic space for itself as a major power in multipolar Asia. Um, I think the bottom line is that India cannot escape the BRI, but it cannot join the BRI at the same time. Uh, unfortunately, they lack today a strategic and a viable strategy to compete with the BRI. There are many ways that India is dealing with the BRI. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a major, a constant challenge for India in the next future. Uh, the BRI project for sure, but before we get into what India is doing uh, to counter BRI uh, efforts, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, India has long tradition of supporting infrastructure project in Asia and Africa. It's not something that is new to India. I think that one of the changes we can see when it comes to India uh, and the BRI is affecting that is uh, India's uh, willingness to cooperate with other power uh, from the region and outside the region. Um, and that connects us actually to what we are here to talk about, uh, the Aramid uh, uh, Corridor. But before we get to that, there are a few projects that can, can be seen as India's way of dealing and encounter China's BRI before the Aramid Corridor. Uh, one of them is uh, the Neighborhood First Policy, announced in 2014 by Narendra Modi. And the idea was to reach out to countries in the region in order to promote uh, a partnership across the region. 
Uh, and this balancing strategy actually marks the departure uh, from India's unsustainable effort to insulate South Asia as its exclusive sphere of influence uh, and deny access to other uh, uh, forces, other powers. Uh, when it comes to the neighborhood first policy, I can mention a few projects that India has involved. One of them is the BBIN corridor, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal. And this pact actually signed in 2015. And the idea was to facilitate a, a easier movements of peoples and goods across the region um, and to maximize, in order to maximize the economic potential of all these countries and basically prevent them to approach China to get their goals. Uh, well, we can uh, mention as well the Kaladan Multimodal trans Transport Project in Myanmar and the railway system in Sri Lanka. An Indian company is involved in uh, the upgrade of their railway system uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, when it comes to Asia, I think uh, we can see uh, India involvement and cooperation with uh, US and Japan. We saw how India cooperated uh, with US in uh, Afghanistan, how they're cooperating with Japan in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, both countries, US and, and Japan, uh, decided uh, to establish the Asia-Africa Road Corridor, which will co cover also the Indian Ocean um, area. Uh, the Asia-Africa border actually is announced in 2016, but this is further highlights India's willingness to uh, find an alternative to approach the PRI. Uh, unfortunately, not much uh, progress has been made when it comes to this corridor. Um, another project that India is involved in is the International North-South uh, Transport Corridor, what we call the INSTC. And until the Arab Med Corridor, I think this, this could be regarded as India's best way to deal with the China Belt Road Initiative. The INSTC is at 7,200 kilometers uh, of long multimodal transport, uh, transportation network connecting uh, rail, sh uh, ships, uh, sea and uh, road uh, uh, routes. Uh, it uh, links the Indian Ocean to the Caspian Sea through the Persian Gulf, into Russia and then Northern Europe. Uh, it actually offers India the shortest way to reach Europe, which is 40% faster, 30% cheaper than the normal Suez Canal route. Uh, but unfortunately, over the last two decades, uh, the route development has been beset by a couple of series of geoeconomic and uh, uh, geopolitical and economic uh, uh, setbacks. There has been this plan to link the islands to sea with the Chabahar port, uh, and the Chabahar port actually gives India the access to Central Asia, to Afghanistan, and Chabahar port by itself could be uh, seen as India's response to BRI. Uh, basically to the Galdar port in Pakistan, which is only 75 kilometers away. Um, this is, uh, in Afghanistan and Iran, India's involved as, as well in the investments in over uh, land in, in, in transportation uh, routes and, and, and investments uh, in Afghanistan northwards. Uh, this project actually ran into a couple of difficulties, as many of you know, because of New Delhi compliance with Washington uh, unilateral sections over Iran. Uh, and there was this tension between Iran and Azerbaijan, uh, the Karabakh war as well, and I don't know if, how many uh, of you know, but uh, Azerbaijan support Pakistan stance regarding Kashmir, and that's definitely irks India. Um, I want to mention as well the B3W, uh, the Build Back Better World, uh, actually announced by the G7, even though India is not part of the G7, but it's definitely invited to participate and uh, promote that. So, um, anyway, I have to skip that part. Uh, let's talk about the Arab Med Corridor, uh, which is the reason why we hear the AMC. Uh, it's funny because I discussed about the importance and the emergence of this new access. In the, in the Middle East or in the world, we want to call it in one of my doctoral uh, chapter, and I feel very proud to witness this historical event happening. Um, so the AMC is basically a thousand kilometers uh, long multimodal uh, network of roads, ships, rail connecting India with the Arab countries and Greece. This is uh, for India, it's another way to reach the European markets. Uh, it will mainly help the uh, agriculture sector, the technology, the energy sector. Uh, once the UAE to Israel corridor will be operational, then according to some estimates, Indian goods can reach Europe in 10 days. 
uh, which really gives 40% uh, cut in travel time uh, compared to normal Suez Canal, uh, which gives India the same advantage as the INSTC, the uh, International North South Corridor. Um, this corridor basically is based on three elements uh, that together become something bigger. One element is the prosperous relation between India and the UAE. The second element is the construction of the railway uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and uh, to the port of Haifa, uh, following uh, the Abraham Accords in 2020. And the third element is the great uh, relations, the good relations Israel has, uh, the maritime relations as well with uh, Greece. Uh, so together, this becomes something bigger, and we would not be able to talk about the AMC, the Arab Quarter, without. Uh, the normalization in uh, Israel-UAE relations. For India, this quarter is important because it forms an alternative to the troubled Chabahar port and the INSTC uh, corridor. This new quarter basically turns India's third largest partner, which is the UAE, into a connecting node for India to uh, Europe. Uh, the aim of India is to actually use the ports in the Gulf and uh, to ship out island goods uh, to the Middle East and then to Europe. Uh, as you know, that correlates with India's uh, great uh, mission to be the bread uh, basket of the world, of the management region, but also the world. Uh, when it comes to uh, India, it means transfer of petroleum faster to India. Uh, for Greece, uh, it means that this collaboration with Israel could also be helpful in stepping up in, against uh, Turkey's uh, you know, uh, exploitation of the Mediterranean Sea in many in many ways. Um, I want to mention that uh, India still has good relations with Iran. It can still connect and use the part of the islands to sea and the Chabahar port and ship uh, its good through Armenia to uh, Georgia if it wants to skip Russia. Uh, but it looks that India is more interested in AMC, the Arab corridor, because it's more stable for India. Uh, if we look at the regime of the Gulf countries of, uh, of Jordan and Israel, they're considered much more stable. None of them is uh, under any American pressure. Not, none of them has been economically uh, isolated. And unlike uh, Iran, even though China is highly investing in Iran and promised to invest uh, what was uh, 400 million dollars in the next 25 years, so yeah, that's that's an important thing. Uh, but as you see, many things. Uh, to make the AMC a reality, uh, some changes have to be made, and one of them is uh, Saudi Arabia uh, should give uh, Israel uh, permission to uh, to allow Israel to bound shipment bound shipment to the North South uh, Railway. A small and symbolic uh, pro progress has been made in 2018 when uh, Saudi Arabia gave permission to uh, to India to their air India fly over its uh, sky. Um, over its skies, but um, since then many many changes happened. Uh, of course, we had the normalization, the Arab Accords, the secret visit of Netanyahu in Saudi Arabia, um, and uh, as what we know, uh, Washington is uh, putting pressure on Riyadh to normalize its relations with Israel, and uh, according to what we just uh, apparently this new. Uh, um, the next visit of Biden is supposed to bring another uh, development. Uh, according to the rumors, uh, it will allow Israeli airlines to fly over Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, of course, many changes have to be made, and we have to make sure these countries have to make sure that Egypt, uh, uh, you know, will not uh, this new quarter will not have a much effect on the revenues from the Suez Canal. So, this is another problem. But if we compare. China Belt Road Initiative to the AMC. So definitely China Road Belt Road Initiative is massive and bigger, uh, but bigger is not always better when it comes up to strategically significant uh, uh, partnership. Uh, there is no reason that, uh, to believe that India will support the BRI. I think that uh, India will continue to uh, seek for better connectivity for itself to Europe. Uh, definitely the connection, the relation between China and Pakistan and the growing presence of China in the Indian Ocean will be a constant challenge for India in the next uh, years. Uh, I think that if India, if China wants to cooperate with India when it comes to connectivity, it has to market in a different way, not under the BRI stamp and something that will give India an equal status. 
Um, I don't think India is competing with China when it comes to connectivity. One of India's strategies is to wait and watch and look. It turns in their favor. Uh, the Abraham Accords happen. That changes everything for them. Um, but there is no doubt that the AMC can re reconfigure uh, patterns between uh, Indian Ocean, the Gulf countries, and uh, Europe. The extent to which India will be able to uh, will succeed at the uh, industrial value chain integration will determine India's uh, role in this new Euro-Asian economic architecture. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bervadka. And last but not least, um, we have Dr. Wan Lanyong from Shanghai International Studies University on uh, the new crossroads, Chinese in Afghanistan. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, 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 well, my field work in Afghanistan in the past uh, half year. Well, it's uh, just because I have a very big <laughs> presentation, but it's about the over three million people. <laughs> so I have, I actually I have the over the something. Like I have a slide about the uh, sun team. So it's so big. So actually, but, uh, in the past uh, half year, but uh, I visited Afghanistan uh, two times, and I stayed there uh, about the three months, and to visit uh, different uh, provinces, uh, especially but because my research always focuses on the Chinese. Okay. So, okay. 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 So, okay. Uh, because my research always focuses on the Chinese investment abroad because I have a background of a PhD. But so today I, I, want, I will talk about the relations just for in the, from the economic world. But I, I have no idea I need the international relations. So I just uh, do uh, just for the face. So uh, please note, uh, as I mentioned, but uh, I stayed in uh, Afghanistan uh, for the, uh, together uh, three months and uh, visited uh, at least uh, 12 cities and uh, villages. And uh, the interview, uh, uh, I have uh, about the 80, uh, 80, 81 interviews. Actually, I visited at least uh, 175 percent, yeah, including uh, different, uh, from different countries. Uh, you can understand most of them are Taliban. <laughs> okay, so. Let me talk about. Uh, actually, uh, this other line. So just uh, the first one. Uh, I want to talk a uh, very brief, a uh, very brief introduction for the current situation in Afghanistan you know, about the so-called the humanitarian crisis and the situ and the security situation. This and then, and I will talk about the, uh, the current Chinese in Afghanistan. And uh, but the real question for this presentation is about the. I wonder if there is some new business opportunity for Chinese. And the last one, I want to talk about uh, some of the key uh, impact factors for Chinese investment in the future. Uh, the, uh, actually, we know that uh, the humanitarian crisis is uh, maybe it's a <coughs> serious, terrible, but uh, I can find some of the different aspects. You all, we all can, we can always have to get this data from the WFP or, the, or other international organizations. Uh, I want to do, to mention that, but I got this picture yeah, from the uh, Afghanistan in the different city and the different uh, village. For example, this is Kabul, but this uh, the biggest slum in Kabul. But uh, most of the poor, poor people, they, all, they have no house, they have no land, so they have to move to the mountain. Illegally, 
including many, many uh, teachers. And all, you can always get this picture in the street, the, the, the background. But especially, we worry about these people, young girls, boys, and in the street, in the different cities. And for this slide, last slide, actually, they are addicts. But they are young, they are boy. in flat. Many, 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 many young boys, young girl, and women. They are addicts. And, and the, the, the right is uh, some of the, uh, the boy beggar in the Bamiyang, you know, very famous city. Uh, actually, Dr. Uh, we can say Dr. P, the country build, the very, the, 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 had a very huge contribution to the uh, local people, but uh, I guess maybe enough. Okay, the, the key point is the uh, transportation bottleneck. So this is the point for to understand Afghanistan situation. Maybe later I will mention that maybe this is a new opportunity for any, any international investors and the international contractors. So, please understand, this is the first point of the virus change. Also, if, uh, all the international media always report a very serious humanitarian, humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. But I, I got the pictures in the, uh, in the northern mountain in Afghanistan. But WFP announced that currently they are working in Kabul and Kandahar. What's the spot? We don't know. We don't know. No, we don't know who's who stopped. But anyway, we can always get this. The picture in the very uh, uh, the, the village and the mountain, but we cannot find it in Kabul. But I just can find the helicopter of the WFT in Kabul. No, no track. But uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese NGO always currently private the uh, many uh, food aid, uh, food aid. Until, until now, the Chinese government uh, private at least uh, seven thousand tons the, the, the food to Afghanistan. I got the picture. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway. Oh, so sorry. Anyway, many inter international uh, organizations, they are still working in Afghanistan. Also, the situation is uh, very serious. It's uh, very difficult to operate it. But uh, you, we can notice they're very familiar with uh, the, the international organizations and, uh, and international NGOs. I want to talk this very strange, but uh, for this, for my, this to visit uh, Afghanistan, one side, we always, we always suppose the so-called humanitarian crisis or food crisis that means no food. Actually, no. You can always bury the food and the clothes is enough in the street. At least in the major street, in the major cities, for example, in Kabul, in Kalat, in Kandahar. So, you can, you can notice traffic jam. Uh, like a song. <laughs> so we can understand that this is the this, 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 this most famous the, uh, river, river market in Martin Tabur, in Tabur. So you, you can you can uh, you can imagine the the trip the the business trip. But then I, I got this uh, picture from the, the bank, the local bank. But actually until now the Taliban government just uh, just uh, triggered as the cash withdrawal from the bank. Actually, from the economic management, it's right. It just, it just avoid the inflation, it's right. But the result is that the normal people has no cash. Uh, so, uh, actually, please notice this. Every day, or every two days, I always use the US dollar to exchange our penny in the street. So I record up every time the exchange rate. But in the last year, last, year, uh, last November, the, maybe you can show about the close, the, bank, the one dollar is uh, where was the one hundred of Ghani. But the Nadim in the April, we noticed about uh, just about the one dollar, it was uh, where was the 85. It means, what, what do you mean? It means Afghan get uh, more and more US dollar. So, so cold. So, 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 I, I know someone always blame USA or international always international organization. The store for the cash to into Af Afghanistan, but just for this, 
much happen. It's not the truth. Okay. About the Mediterranean crisis, I said, I guess maybe, actually, it's not a food crisis, at least in a major city. Major, maybe it's just the economic crisis. This is like Taliban officials ask, always ask us to. Uh, also, you, uh, you can uh, private the uh, humanitarian aid uh, in material, but uh, we are in need of cash. So, if you want to help me, help us, you can take more US dollars into Afghanistan. We don't need the food. So, you're very interesting. Uh, a second, I want to uh, don't talk about the situation, the, the security the situation. But in the my, in the first of the, in my first visit in Af in Afghan, but I record all of the six bomb attack in Kabul in the one month, and I got this. I I got this. But you, you can notice the most of a bomb attack. The the target is not Taliban. It's a Hajar, India. And minority. So we always think, who did this terrorist attack? But it's the first time. The second time it's different. Second time, but it's just the, 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 the last ten days the, the, for, for my the second visit to Afghanistan. I, I recorded this. But the, just the, the less than ten days, uh, the, the whole country uh, died in the terrorist attack. Uh, about 100 percent. But most of, most of the attack. Uh, always is, uh, 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 is responsible for the ISIS corruption and the, uh, the former government of uh, the army, for the so called the Northern uh, Alliance. <coughs> but uh, so until now, Taliban is a very sensitive any news, any news for the terrorist. For example, I took the picture of the Taliban soldiers. So, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so I can So also, we, 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 we went to the, 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 the field, we, can, we cannot take more picture. So actually, we, we can say the so-called the security the security situation in Afghanistan is quite different. The public situation is uh, security is it's good. It's the social. It's okay. But the terrorist situation is a, is a, we can say is a, is worthy. Terribly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, second, I can talk about the Chinese in Afghanistan. Uh, who's not working? Um, uh, actually, more and more Chinese. Going to Afghanistan in unbeatable speed. We never imagine so many Chinese in Afghanistan now. But most of Chinese, they always interested in so called Afghanistan mineral resource. But according to my field work, for example, I do this field work in the Badakhshan province. But uh, I just for the Mika mining, but I go from there. But uh, I finally no load. I have to be the Taliban soldier and I go to the mountain and uh, from uh, this. So the the elevator to the elevator. So I can actually, it's a very very difficult to get any mining exploration in Afghanistan. So I guess maybe so called Afghanistan mining is just. Uh, Always be uh, considered a joke in the mouth trap. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, but the many Chinese they always do the humanitarian aid, including me. For example, the, the, this time I, the, I, I, I was on behalf of the uh, top, the, the top university in China to private this uh, uh, the humanitarian aid. But uh, our, uh, our university always private humanitarian to the teachers, and my, the, another Chinese they, for example, the, they, they, they private us to the refugee. Uh, okay, uh, the point is that uh, is there any business activity in Afghanistan? Please notice. Uh, I, can, I can show all of this economic data. Okay, uh, we have no time. Uh, we don't need to talk about Please notice uh, actually, Afghanistan, in, in summary, is very big for its economic products and economic structure. Please notice. Uh, so called manufacturing all, only occupied less than. 6% of GDP. So you can, you can imagine, no any country. Uh, until now, they have some, some of the so called uh, the six, uh, six industrial park. I visit at least the three the industrial park. Actually, very few factory, uh, factory there. And we notice uh, Afghanistan international trade, but uh, it's not so, so big. 
the most interesting is the Afghanistan export and the import. If you notice, that, uh, it's a major uh, the international uh, the trade partner. Is, uh, uh, we can notice uh, uh, India, first one India, and then uh, it's uh, Pakistan, and, uh, and, and third maybe the China. And, uh, okay. and uh, just for the product, uh, you can notice that uh, actually uh, Pakistan uh, always import of, of what? Always import the consumer goods. And export what? No mining. Pretty much no mining. Just uh, export uh, textile and clothing. And the vegetable. So, so called Afghan is rich in mining. How? We, we cannot see. Uh, actually, in the past 20 years, you know, Afghanistan is, uh, uh, has a, uh, uh, we can say, is a highly independent. You know, highly independent of the international, uh, the international assistance. Uh, so we can notice always this is a very familiar uh, the, the international aid, for example, especially USAID. And now the often the Indian, the, Indian, the, the, the so called power and the water and the others, but it is the in the in the in the uh, Actually. Uh, we can do something, but the so called uh, rich is many, but I think it is not true. But uh, actually, the Afghanistan can actually can get deep spirits from some African countries, <coughs> for example, Angola. But uh, I actually, yesterday, I, I fly from Angola to, uh, to get uh, some of the Chinese, uh, Chinese businessmen. But uh, they, they stayed in Angola for uh, in the past 20 years. They have a very rich. But they always think maybe Afghanistan can get deep spirits from uh, Angola. But why Chinese go close to Afghanistan? But uh, we can talk about uh, the two key impact factors. The uh, first one is so uh, that uh, China, China development market. Actually, we notice that the, the, the trade with the, 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 the Afghanistan is very, very little. And we understand. I actually we notice this. Uh, we always say China's Ch Chinese the biggest the trade partner always USA, EU, and Japan, not developing countries. You know, and it's even investment. And uh, but uh, in, for international engineer country uh, contract uh, construction is different. The China market always focus on the Asia and Africa. So maybe Afghanistan can provide a new opportunity for Chinese contractor. Uh, okay, so uh, a second I come to Pakistan. Actually we can say Pakistan CPAC uh, is the closing over. Because it's quite different, but until now, China has invested CPEC about the 6.7 the six point seven the six point seven US billion US dollar, very huge. Only, only eight years, very very huge. But the, now it is uh, going to the second 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 stage. We notice actually Pakistan economy is decreasing in the very very speed growth. And also the state, Pakistan, Pakistan manufacturing of the occupied is a very little shell. Also, okay, uh, especially is very important. Uh, actually, it means that China, although China has invested a very huge amount of capital in Pakistan, but Pakistan cannot accept it. So I we call it the autonomy post a big, big part. And uh, so, you know this, uh, you know, the terrorist situation in Pakistan is the worst in terrorism. You know the Confucius Institute, not uh, the, the two months ago. So finally, uh, reveal that uh, many Chinese uh, the, actually in the, 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 the ten years ago, I got the I got the conclusion. So many Chinese companies uh, they are not uh, going out. They just squeeze out because it's just a very serious competition in Chinese domestic market. And so the most of the emerging partners generally provide a marginal value. It means the other biggest, very important the trade, the, the, the big economic always of a developed, developed country, not developing country. So we can ask, actually, I have no answer. I just wonder, Afghanistan will be a new partner? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of our presenters and, and some really fascinating and, and quite diverse 
perspectives and, and insights on, on China and, and Nena. Um, before I pass to some questions for the audience, I want to take the chair's prerogative and, and sort of ask a, a general question to all three presentations. I mean, uh, we had, you know, uh, a general perspective on, on Russia and China and the Middle East. Uh, some some discussion on, on India and investments in, in transport infrastructure there. I believe you mentioned you know, rail links as well, which is very interesting to me. Uh, and Dr. Wang, you know, you discussed some of these, these opportunities for, for transport and connectivity in, in Afghanistan. But as we've seen over the last decade or so, a lot of these Belt and Road infrastructure projects have run into serious economic issues. Uh, it's very, very difficult to make transport and connectivity infrastructure profitable. So I, I want to throw a question to you and, and uh, take it however you want um, and discuss however you wish it in, in conjunction with the other questions. But, you know, what is the, the kind of economic rationale? How do you make these projects economically sustainable for the part of China, but also Russia uh, and, and Indian partners? All right, I'm going to let them sit on that and then throw it open to the floor. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Uh, gentleman in, in the blue shirt. Yeah, my name is Michael Jankalov. Oh, please wait for the microphone. My name is Michael Jankalovitz. I see during the symposium the issue of tourism is not addressed. I was in Egypt three years ago and Cairo was inundated with Chinese tourists. I don't see Chinese tourists in Israel. Uh, could somebody please address the issue of tourism as a Chinese uh, strategic goal? Uh, and let's take a second question. Um, gentleman on the left. Please introduce yourself. Hi there. Um, my name is Jason Lee. I'm with the Schools in San Andreas in Washington. Um, I think my question is a two-finger to Yunnan's question, which is, um, and it's directed at Dr. Wong. Um, we know that the Chinese model for development uh, throughout BRI has been peace through development, um, and China has immense security concerns of destabilization along its border with, uh, with Afghanistan. So my question, I, th I think, is to um, probe you on your question of, or your comment of um, whether or not China would supplement the transport bottleneck that you mentioned um, in hopes of preventing destabilization and, and providing security for Afghanistan. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go back to the panel. So can I ask you to start, Dr. Zip? So you had, you had asked me a question about fissures, right? Um, what are the fissures um, that I see between China and Russia? Um, there are a few, and I mentioned in my presentation, uh, being whether China will continue to see uh, whether well, or working with Russia will still provide the value add in MENA, given that Russia is going to be distracted. So from that, I would suggest that if we look at weapons, I think that could be um, an area of uh, competition between uh, Russia and China post to Ukraine, whenever that happens. Um, and that's because um, Russia will be very focused on rebuilding um, its military, right? I mean, most of you will have read that the Russians are not doing great in Ukraine. Um, a lot of their equipment is being decimated, so they're going to have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to resupply the Russian army, which is of course going to be its focus because it's national security. So having done that, they may not be able to fulfill some of their export contracts um, uh, in terms of exporting arms and goods. So, so I think that that could be an issue. Um, as well, of course, Russia's under sanctions um, uh, and semiconductors are in short supply and Russia doesn't produce its own semiconductors which are needed in some of its weapon systems. So that's going to be an issue and will China step in? That's the question, right? Um, Russia, uh, China has been building up its arms industry. It used to depend a lot on buying Russian arms, but it's having a lot of indigenous uh, production right now. So the question is whether China will step into the void. And if it does, then is that going to annoy Russia? But then again, Russia can't really do anything about it because you know it, it needs to focus more on building its, its military. So that would be my response to you. Um, quick question, I'm just going to quote from one of you on Michael's question on Chinese um, tourists. I would also say that, and I'll leave that to you, 
Uh, but Russian tourists uh, is another interesting thing. So Russians are huge uh, numbers of tourists, um, particularly in Turkey and Egypt, right? Um, as well as in the Gulf countries. Um, fallen, falling off of numbers clearly because of COVID restrictions. Um, but in the Middle East, we've seen a whole host of them coming back recently, partly because Middle East has welcomed not just Russian tourists, but Russian money as well. And so for, for Turkey and Egypt, we're still trying to attract the Russian tourists because China's under lockdown, so forget that market for a while. But the key right now is the um, Russian tourists that they're trying to win back. But of course, because of problems with payments, you know, it's not easy for Russian tourists to actually pay for stuff. Um, so, so that's going to be key for, for some of these inner countries. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions. But uh, first one about the tourism. I, actually, I have no here, but actually I have to say, but uh, uh, actually I, I, I ever stayed in Egypt for three years, but I never tourist anywhere, apart from the New Zealand. Because, but uh, you know, actually, you know, there are more and more Chinese tourists uh, uh, going to the uh, Egypt, for example, and then for other the Middle Eastern countries, for example, uh, Turkey. But most of uh, Chinese tourists, uh, they always prefer the developing countries, for example, especially Europe. So the, for the, the reason, main reason, first one is the uh, safety. The second, the service. And the third, and the third, uh, it's also language. So I, can, I I guess maybe in the, in the future the the, 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 the mid, Middle East country will uh, attract more and more China China, China tourists, but uh, the, the, we, we can expect it. Uh, attract. But the second, uh, I want to uh, talk about the transportation. But uh, also we know China China is now the number one the trade country in the world. But actually, please understand, China is also the number one in the international contractors. Also, the value or turnover of trade, the Canada compared, the, the, I can say the international engineer contract that the Canada compared to the, uh, to the international trade, but the international engineer contract, the, the, the construction is very, very important to China. China. Why? You know, in the past 20 years, construction sector is the sector with the, uh, we can say the fattest growth sector in, in China. You cannot imagine how many employees in one the giant Chinese international contractor. For example, you know, maybe you know the uh, EMR engineers and the, uh, engineer and the, 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 the news report the public by, uh, by, by USA. This this journal always uh, always have a list of them every year to to, uh, to have the top top two hundred fifty international contractors in the world. According to the updated data, you know, in this two hundred fifty international data from China, about the seventy five companies. Also, international contractors always has a very low profit, but. The point is that they can provide very huge employment. So it's very important. Because especially this year, you can understand the employee rate, the employee situation is very, very serious in China, especially for the college student. So I guess. I guess maybe this is why just now I said that also maybe Afghanistan or Pakistan is not so important just from economic view, the, 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 the point of view to China, but it's very important to Chinese employment. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to address your question, answer your question about how you make connectivity project profitable. I don't think I have the answer because I'm not an economist, but what can I say? is that if we compare China to India, China can make it faster compared to India. And if you know doing business with India comes with a lot of bureaucracy, and they're trying to uh, improve that. Uh, but uh, there is no doubt that the Indian bureaucracy is a major problem for a connectivity project. If we look at their, um, how they manage the uh, Chabahar port project and the Farzad B. So in many ways, if you can look at it, India lost in a way because it waited so long to make progress with these projects. And then the Taliban took over uh, uh, Afghanistan and they changed the picture. 
But uh, even though India doesn't have the the power, the economic power, and the right bureaucracy to uh, execute this kind of project faster, uh, India has a better way to do it uh, by building partnerships. And I think the AMC, the Arab Med Corridor, is a great example for that because each of these countries has an interest to make it a multifunctional corridor, and that can help India to actually make it properly. Thank you. Um, we can take another round of questions from the floor. So, can we go to the back? As I do this, I just want to say one thing on Michael's question. In preparing this conference, we would have loved to have more participants from China. But if they come out, then they get back in. They have to be in quarantine for up to three weeks. So I think this is one reason, as I toured Israel, I didn't see any Chinese tourists either. I saw Japanese, I saw Korean, I saw Russian, but I didn't see Chinese. So when China begins to open its policies, I think you will again see the flow of tourists. Hi. Um, so you guys know me, I, I think. Um, so a question for, for Dr. Lee Chen. Um, and it will be a little bit provocative here because you, you, you uncorked the question of Russia and China. So I have to ask, right, from the, the relationship that you laid out is, I think, fo uh, less than the strategic alliance that we in Washington talked about, right? Where there's a lot of talk about the strategic alliance between uh, China and Russia. I think you uh, laid out, I think, very correctly that this is more of a alignment rather than an alliance. How does the Ukraine war fit in here? What? How is Russian? Uh, how is Chinese thinking changing as a result of Russian actions? I'm sort of I'm interested in sort of the dynamism of this process. So. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Okay. Uh, gentlemen. Yeah. And with regard to the. Could you just briefly introduce yourself? Larry Swirsky. With regard to the new capital in uh, Egypt, built by the Chinese. The opera will be opening in another few months. Has it, and to what extent has it influenced the flow of tourism and other activities from China to Egypt? All right, and I think we have time to squeeze in a, a final question. We have a question over here. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Sarah Feinberg. I work for um, um, the Israeli Air Force Research Center at Tel Aviv University. I was fascinated by your point about China and uh, Russia being a force multiplier in MENA. And I was wondering if you could please elaborate upon uh, the military and technological aspect of it. You said Russia is strong in the conventional area where you know China uh, has its specific niche but together they form a force multiplier in that security realm and I was wondering if you could please lay out the implications uh, and especially for Israel from an Israeli point of view in your assessment. All right, so I think a lot of questions for Dr. Sin there, but uh, if the other panelists want to add any comments or also questions to each other, um, there's also space for that. Right, um, so uh, Ilan, let me uh, answer your question first. Um, Ukraine war and how Russia and China figure into this and uh, in the relationship. Um, well, China has, so in terms of an alignment, China has chosen to align with Russia and the Ukraine war in that, in its narrative, it has supported the uh, Russian, you know, the, the Russian narrative that it's um, NATO and its expansion that's to blame, and the Chinese media has also picked that up. So um, what we see is that Russia has actually tended to show the world that it's actually a David and Goliath situation, but not in terms of Russia versus Ukraine, David and Goliath, but it's NATO versus Russia. So they've actually turned that around and said that, look, it's us poor Russians, you know, um, uh, we're David and we're fighting against this unfair Goliath um, NATO. So they have actually quite effectively, at least in the Arab world, portrayed this idea, and the Chinese media has amplified that as well, 
not saying that they agree with it, but they've actually amplified that in the media. So um, to Sarah, that would be an aspect of how they, uh, you know, force multiplied in media, but in, in the media sense, right? So, so they actually use the same narrative. Does the media agree with it? But at least they put it out there, right? And the impact of it in, in the Middle East and including Israel is that people begin to believe it, right? If you keep hearing this from the Russian source, but then you also hear it from the Chinese source, and both of them are in Arabic uh, language media. Then you begin to say, oh, there's actually quite some credibility in it. It's, just, it's not just Russian, but Chinese are saying it. And, and, and so this becomes a credibility aspect, because don't forget, in, in, especially in the Gulf, people don't really read a lot. Okay? Um, they consume a lot of social media, but they don't actually take the time to read you know, a, a five-page article. So it's the sound bites that, that get them, and, and these sound bites are very effective through social media. Right? So um, it's the sound bites part that you, know, you see China and Russia aligning. Now, um, Chinese have not actually gone out to fully support Russia. They have actually said they're going to stop some use with Russia, whether it's about supplying aircraft parts, or whether it's an investment in Russia, they've actually pulled back, right? Um, but they haven't criticized it, right? So whether it's they're pulling back because they're scared of being hit with secondary sanctions from the US in the future, that that's something else we'll see. But it's quite clear that the Chinese are thinking long term, right? Um, there is some short term gain um, to uh, to be gained with Russia, but in the long term, are the sanctions, possible sanctions, actually worth it? Right? So I think that for Chinese companies that have international assets, um, that's something that they have to think two and three times about. It's very, very careful for them. Right? Um, and so if I can now address um, Sarah's question, more specifically on the military. Um, yes, there is a force multiplier effect there, and Chinese drones are being used to supplement Russian technology uh, because Chinese drones, there is no uh, specifications of where you can or cannot use Chinese drones. Whereas for uh, American drones, they actually are, you actually have to sign a contract saying you wouldn't use them in certain military conditions. Right? So the Chinese drones don't come with these restrictions, and so they cannot supplement um, what some of the Gulf states are doing in Yemen and in Syria, etc. So that's a really useful force multiplier for Russia and China because they're being seen as being, you know, military, providing some sort of security um, for the Gulf states in these conflict areas. So that's quite a big one. But the problem is that um, there are other players in the drone market, right? And so here is where Turkey um, acts as a kind of a force subtractor from this alignment, the China-Russia alignment, because Turkey as the Ukraine war has shown, has got very good drones. The Bayraktar drones are fantastically efficient. They've been taking out Russian tanks. So in this sense, then, Turkey, which is of course a NATO partner, then comes in as a force subtractor to this force multiplier effect. And of course, Israelis also have their own drone systems. Um, and so you, you can't see a tension there, right? Is Russia and China going to continue as a force um, multiplied in terms of technology, security technology, military security technology, or not? Of course, it depends on sanctions on Russia, because of semiconductors, it depends on whether China gets hit with secondary sanctions being keep sent to Russia. So, lots of questions there. But um, I think that the, the alignment will kind of continue. Maybe they're not going to sh show it as much because what we've seen in the Gulf states recently. It's just, there's not so much noise about China. Um, being on the ground there, they, they, for the past few years, there's a lot of noise about China, but they're trying to maybe downplay it a little bit for some reason. Um, but it's in preparation for the Biden visit. I don't know, but that's something that we can watch for. I think on the previous uh, panel, somebody asked something about Sri Lanka and China, and I just want to add the Indian perspective. Because of the economic crisis, I think that was India's way to find its way uh, back in, into Sri Lanka. That was an opportunity to show that India is can be the net security provider for China. Uh, so the economic crisis actually works for the benefit of India, and it's still working. And the Indian, uh, and this crisis is being perceived like that in, uh, from the perspective of the Indian government. And we can see that since the crisis, like in the beginning of January, um, India um, gave loans to uh, Sri Lanka, uh, was able to sh uh, ship some food and medical supply to, uh, 
So I think this crisis works for the benefit of India. Somebody else. All right. Well, with that, um, please give a hand to our panel, and uh, thank you.